Welcome back. Here's where we left off. Every single part has now been removed from the engine and cleaned up. It's time to finish priming, painting, and do some work on the individual components. With the gas tank removed, I sprayed Rust-Oleum primer on all bottom surfaces. I made a small dolly to hold the block while painting. The rest of the block, inside and out, were primed with a brush. I thinned the primer slightly and applied two coats. The water hopper and crankcase got an additional coat. It was easier to use a brush than to mask off the machine surfaces that I wanted to remain unpainted. After several days, I brushed on two finished coats of Rust-Oleum Hunter Green. While the block was drying, I turned my attention to the skid. I sprayed it down with solvent and gave it a good going over with a wire brush. The previous owners had added the heavy-duty lift rings, which I removed, cleaned, and primed in the usual manner. I wanted to keep these in use. Only a faint trace of the original skid lettering showed up, but not enough to read. Because of the added lifting rings, the complete lettering that appeared on the engine would not fit. It used to say, McCormick Deering Kerosene, and then 6 horsepower. The skid was primed with Rust-Oleum Gray Wood Primer and then two finished coats of Hunter Green. I used spray cans and all the paint baked in the sun for a couple of days. For an earlier project, I had drawn up the skid lettering using internet pictures as a template. I had a typeface in my professional drawing program, which was used as a starting point and I tweaked the individual letters as needed. Good friend Mac McCormick took the file and cut the stencil on oil board available from Amazon with his fancy CO2 laser. I gave the back of the stencils a light coat of spray adhesive and carefully aligned them on the skid. There would be a lot of overspray so I made sure everything was well covered. Plain old Rust-Oleum spray paint did the trick. While the lettering may not be 100% prototypically correct, it looks good enough for me. As everything else continued to bake in the sun, I started reassembly of the fuel pump. Again, following Shop Dog Sam's mini videos, I polished the valve seats and replaced the old check balls with new ones. The plunger packing was replaced and the unit reassembled. I rigged up a way to test the pump with kerosene and it worked perfectly. Low tension magnetos supply a very brief pulse of alternating current between 5 and 8 volts depending on the speed of the engine and the strength of the horseshoe magnets. I disassembled the magneto and cleaned it with solvent then burnished the electrical connections. Like all electrical circuits, it is absolutely critical there be a low resistance path between the magneto frame and the igniter frame. The ignition wire from the magneto terminal to the igniter terminal is only one half of the circuit. This is why the igniter is connected to the head using brass gaskets. It also illustrates why you must be sure no paint or grease insulates the many metal contact surfaces between the magneto and the igniter. I'll show you more about this on the final assembly in the next episode. Dr. David Cave is a regular contributor to Gas Engine Magazine. He's written several articles about magnetos and I suggest you read them. Dr. Cave has also produced a replacement horseshoe magnet that is more powerful than the old original magnets. I decided to try one. I rigged the magneto with its original magnets to an LED in series with a 470 ohm resistor and my digital multimeter. 
carefully turning the rotor with a battery powered drill motor, you see the results. Then I replaced the original magnets with Dr. Cave's new magnet and ran the same test. Obviously, the new magnets deliver more juice to the meter. Dr. Cave's contact information is in the video description. Doc told me he made these magnets for John Deere engines. They are about one half of an inch too short for the band to fit correctly on the Type R magneto. I think the new brass band came from our friends at Flywheel Supply. Anyway, I simply milled two spacers from half inch steel bar stock and the new band fit very well. Most all the parts have been painted and it was time to clean up the overspray and remove any paint inside machined or mechanical surfaces. I used 220 and 400 grit sandpaper and a birch dowel. A little lacquer thinner here and there and a scotch bright pad finished the job. This was also the time to start removing all paint around the bolt holes on the magneto mount to assure good electrical contact. Also remember to mark the large gear timing marks. I used a white marker. About this time Outlaw Jack gave me a call. The head, piston, and crankshaft were ready. Let's hear what the outlaw has to say. We took an intake valve that was almost 200 thousandths bigger. We cut it down and then I put the 45 back on it and made the margin where it was the valve was the same height as the exhaust valve. And then we bumped the seats on the head. did both sides where the bearing assembly goes and we did the uh, polish the rod journal size on an 8 inch stroke steam engine and then we set the clearance on the rod bearings with shims and got it set between three and a half to four thousand clearance. What we've done is we've done a, a hone on the cylinder where it's a straight hone where it has shoes and stones so it straightens up the cylinder and then you can see what it looks like. Cross hatch pattern, yes. Here's the finished head with the valves installed. Now to the fuel tank. This is the suction assembly after initial cleanup. Note the fuel filter which consists of an 80 mesh brass screen. It was completely shot and the suction was plugged up. I cleaned out the tube with a small drill bit. I also located a small sheet of 80 mesh brass screen and tied it on with thin copper wire. Flywheel Supply has announced a line of custom resin molded replacement fuel tanks with brass fittings for Type M engines. They will be available for one and a half, three, and six horsepower models. Unfortunately, due to my deadline, 
one was not available to use in this engine. My plan B was to try and find a radiator gas tank shop in Waco that could possibly restore the original tank. Meet Jeff, who works for an old-fashioned radiator shop in Waco. He took one look at mine and said, no problem, pal. First off, we had to heat the, the bum up here so we get the nipple out. Uh, we re-ran the seam, pressure checked it. Um, so the seam has completely been redone. Prepared a couple of holes to it. She's ready to go. Ready to go. Thank you, Jeff. That. Perfecto. The three-gallon tank is squeaky clean inside and out and ready to install inside the block. Shown here is every single part of a McCormick Daring 6 horsepower engine. All cleaned, primed, painted, polished, and ready for final assembly. Along with the piston, crankshaft, exhaust components, a 12-inch pulley, and the starting crank. And here are the block, flywheels, and the skid. We'll put this big boy together in part four and make every attempt to crank it up. If you haven't watched the previous two episodes, please do so. I do appreciate your comments and suggestions. Thanks for watching.